Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. This is episode number 692 by my count. And uh, I, my name is Camden Busey. I'm back in Grace Lake, Illinois, after a week of some travel. I'm looking forward to another conversation as we open up today uh, Voss's book, Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments. For Voss group number 68, we we'll turn to pages 250 through 255. With our guest today, we have Lane Tipton, who serves as pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania as well as a uh, fellow of Biblical and Systematic Theology here at Reformed Forum. Welcome back, Lane. It's good to see you today. Good to be here, Camden. Thanks. Yeah, we've got uh, another uh, you know, significant section here as we're looking through Revelation during the, the time of the prophets. Uh, we come now to uh, page 250 to speak about the nature and attributes of Jehovah, looking more specifically at the attribute of righteousness. So excited to, to speak about that today. Uh, Voss speaks about God's righteousness uh, in in a kind of a, a unique way, as he speaks about it as midway between the transcendental and communicative attributes. Now, we you know, whenever you pick up a, a systematic theology text, looking at uh, you know basic things, you'll often see a treatment of the incommunicable and the communicable attributes. Of course, God is unique, and He is his attributes. He doesn't just possess attributes. You know, God is love, for example. He is is omniscient, uh, omnipresent. All of these things are just descriptors of God, but we can't parcel him out into chunks. And even as we describe the incommunicable and the communicable attributes, it's merely a, a mechanism or a way for us to understand that there are some attributes that we see reflected analogically a little bit more clearly. There are ways in which we can apply love, for example, to creatures but it's not as if love is different from God's omniscience <laughs> in the sense of God's very essence. But Voss here is using this convention, but then he speaks about righteousness as being midway between them. Uh, you know, God is no less righteous than he is any of his other attributes, and he's no more righteous than he is any of his other attributes. So what is Voss getting at when he's speaking about righteousness being midway between the transcendental and communicative attributes there on page 250. Yeah, that's a a fascinating way for Voss to speak, Camden. Um, I think what he's trying to help us recognize is that when you're talking about the attributes of God, there's no pure univocal classification of the attributes because God is simple. His attributes can't be partitioned. You you can't say, okay, there are transcendental or incommunicable attributes on the one side. There are communicable attributes on the other side. And then a third class uh, midway between. He's not trying to speak with the kind of analytical rigor that you might find in a systematic theological presentation. I think what he's after here is he's trying to remind us that while God is simple and his attributes are not partitioned, partitioned or divided in any sense. I think what he's after is that the attribute of divine righteousness finds, even though it's identical with God, it finds a unique creaturely analogy that Voss uses throughout this section. And that analogy is that God in his righteousness is a judge. And if you think about it, the for instance, just one comparison. Uh, if you think about God's timeless eternity, that God is infinitely exalted above time, does not participate in time, is not conditioned by time, no particular concrete positive analogy for that comes forth. But in the case of righteousness, Voss turns our attention to scriptural analogies and the presentation of God in his righteousness. And he says that righteousness on page 250 requires us to think about God as a judge. And so possibly with the qualifications that you and I have just put in place, it may be that that midway between the transcendental and communicable uh, or communicative, the way he's putting it here, uh, it's just helping us recognize that while righteousness is identical to God, there's also a very compelling, very clear creaturely analogy for righteousness found in the identity and activity of a human judge. And so I think that might be what he's initially trying to drive us toward, Camden. Yeah, and using that illustration of the judge, whenever we speak of a human judge, for example, a righteous judge would be one who judges according to uh, the standard or the law that is above them, 
that transcends them. Uh, one who is righteous because he adheres strictly to that standard and doesn't sway one way or the other. But with regard to the Lord, we do not have the Lord existing underneath some transcendent law, and his relationship to, to the law is quite unique. Indeed, the law itself is an expression of his very nature and his very character, not the other way around. And so Voss is very intent on explaining this, and also developing this, protecting from various errors. What are some of the other options that we've seen in, in the history of ideas that uh, would far would stray far from the biblical norm? Well, on the one side, if the if the if the analogy on page two hundred and fifty is that an earthly judge rigidly adheres to a law above him, and then Voss says that can't be applied to God because this righteousness is truly within him. Those two quotes frame this. This is avoiding at least two deviant views, uh, two errors on one side or the other. And the first one, Camden, and I'd love your thought on this. The first one would be something like a Platonic view that asserts that God is subject as a, as a demiurge. He is subject to a transcendent moral norm above him so that God as judge, like a human judge, is conforming to a transcendent norm that is good or righteous. And on this view, God would then be in some way submitted to a transcendent standard beyond him and not defined in terms of his nature. But if Voss is saying properly that this righteousness is truly within God, then God himself is that standard. He's not beholden to a higher standard. And so on the one side, I think Voss is really trying to help us avoid what might be viewed as a platonizing error of subordinating God as judge to some kind of transcendent moral norm above him, beyond him, the good, the righteous, etc. Yeah, sure. It, and there are definitely people even within our evangelical orbit that hold to a view like that in practice, whether God's attributes exist in something of a plenum or even just practically speaking, people that don't explicitly advocate a doctrine of God that would separate him from his attributes sometimes may abstract those attributes away from his existence or somehow divide his existence into different modes or types. And uh, we end up with similar problems. So whether it's explicit or implicit, these can be this can be a consequence of a, a poorly understood doctrine of God. Even just an abstract essence apart from the persons is a, is a species of this of this type yes. of error. So we always have to hold together uh, not just who God is and, and how he is, <laughs> the way in which he is and how we can describe him, but that existence, the idea of God and what he is and what he could be uh, in relation to creation uh, is is always the same. We have an immutable God, even in his relation to creation. And I think Voss is trying to in his dogmatics, he certainly does similar things, but he, here in biblical theology, certainly wanting to chart a course that doesn't fall off either side. So we could have an abstract uh, God or, or a creator demiurge that's somehow subject to things outside of himself. Mm -hmm. What are some other uh, possible errors that uh, could arise in this scenario? Well, I, th I think the other major error would be the one that Voss would be most familiar with in his milieu as he's writing the biblical theology, and that would be the positivistic error. Think uh, August Comte, for instance, and that would make the laws of God, the righteousness of God, um, what God requires of his people, nothing more than a fiat uh, that arises from a cultural milieu. Or if you think in terms of something like what Schleiermacher would say, the righteousness of God would be the pious feelings uh, set forth in speech regarding what the ineffable deity might really be. In other words, the, the righteousness of God would be something akin to an ancient cultural construct rather than who God is in himself and that righteousness being a revelation of his unchanging moral character. That righteousness would be something more along the lines of just a culturally accommodated expression of religion. And that would be, of course, 
uh, component with that history of religions approach that we've talked about so much. It would be the standard view of generic liberalism or modernism. And I, I think when, when Voss talks about the 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 idea that these laws, the righteousness of God expressed in his law is not a fiat, uh, a bare fiat, uh, not a bare cultural construction or a human contrivance or something like that. That would be the other major view, which would make, uh, at the end of the day, the the same kind of error of the Platonic view, except eminentizing everything, making everything an eminent, mutable cultural construction when it comes to righteousness and God's law that expresses it. Sure. And it's not to say that the different expressions of God's law are, are, are points at which God is changing. We see throughout Scripture God revealing his law in a variety of ways, often in summary ways. So we have the whole book of Deuteronomy as one example, but also more specifically the Decalogue as we have in, in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy. But you think of a passage such as um, Micah 6, 8, which is a very prime example of a, summer, a summation of all of God's law, or even the, the two great commandments that our Lord gave in the New Testament. These are not contrary to one another, but all of them are expressions of who God is in and of himself, and yet who he calls us to, to be as creatures made in his image. That quote there that Voss has on uh, the top of page 251 the law was not made according to arbitrary fiat. It is a righteous law because conforming to the divine nature, higher than which here is and can be no norm, uh, than which there is and can be no norm. And he quotes Deuteronomy 4.8. Um, so, so that his whole point is that the law of God is an expression of his righteousness and conforms to who God is in himself, in his unchanging character. And um, so it can't be on the one side uh, that God as judge appeals to a norm higher than himself. There is no the none. And it can't be that the law is just a pure cultural construction because then it wouldn't be a revelation from this absolute God. And so Voss is helping us, I think, very helpfully steer that uh, middle path of orthodox, reformed, biblical theology over against speculative options on the one side and historicizing options on the other side. And once again, uh, typically penetrating and extremely useful to, to be a good guide in this regard. Oh, sure. You know, then Voss proceeds uh, to speak about five different facets of God's righteousness, what he calls his forensic or his judicial righteousness. There are different aspects that we can consider that under. Uh, just to list them all, he speaks of a righteousness of cognizance, a righteousness of retribution, a righteousness of vindication, a righteousness of salvation, and then a righteousness of benevolence. Let's start with cognizance, uh, not a word we use all the time. What is he speaking about with this righteousness of cognizance, uh, specifically as God takes notice and keeps account of all moral conduct? Well, that, that really, that sentence right there, page 251, is, is a key. The righteousness of cognizance um, weds the omniscience of God and his rectitude, his righteousness as God. And the, the point is this, every single action, and this is so, this, uh, recognizing this is, is taking one of the first steps through the front door of biblical piety and recognizing how we all live our lives, Camden. Every single action of every moral agent falls immediately under the scrutiny of an all-knowing, righteous God. So God's omniscience is tethered to his righteousness so that as the judge of all, all men, women, boys and girls, all people everywhere, are under the perfect surveillance surveillance of God himself as judge. And so his being God, Voss says, cannot be separated from his procedure as judge. That is, it is God the judge exhaustively 
perfectly surveying all the actions of all individuals, all institutions, and all nations. And this is uh, something that is extremely encouraging for the believer. And it's something that is abjectly terrifying for the unbeliever. Uh, and, and, and Voss doesn't necessarily develop that as fully as he could. But um, let me just say this, Camden, for the righteous, there is a great comfort in this um, notion that God has a righteousness of cognizance, as, as we just defined. This is what is true for the church in Jesus Christ. Nothing that you have suffered in your union with Christ at the hands of wicked men has been overlooked or goes unnoticed by God, but will be brought to light and truth and exposure and ultimately judgment. And the righteousness of cognizance is therefore just an extremely encouraging piece of, of good news uh, for the righteous. So what does this then mean for for the wicked, biblically speaking, as God does have this righteousness of cognizance, certainly uh, the wicked cannot cannot hide from God's view. He knows all things. Uh, um, well, let me ju just say this. Um, in, in this world, Camden, often the wicked veil their wickedness with outward displays of pomp and piety and moral rectitude, and they call good evil and evil good. This happens in religious and secular institutions. It happens in politics and statecraft. It happens at 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 uh, the place of people's vocations. It happens in interpersonal relationships. And here's the point, and this is so important to remember. This is uh, uh, encouraging for the righteous, but absolutely terrifying for the wicked. Jesus in Matthew 12, 36, as the righteous judge incarnate, says, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word that they have spoken. And Paul can say in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 4, do not pronounce judgment before time, before the Lord comes, uh, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. Now, what's so interesting about that 1 Corinthians 4 text is that Paul was being accused in Corinth of being a sham apostle by super apostles. And he says, I'm not aware of anything against myself, verse 4, but I'm not trying to be acquitted. The Lord judges me. Therefore, he draws that conclusion in verse 5. So hear this, both Jesus and Paul were accused by evil men of doing things they did not do. And Jesus perfectly entrusted himself to the Father, to the judgment of God. Paul did the same. What does that mean? It means this, and, and you can use this as witness to unbelievers. It means that when you see righteousness exhibited in the people of God, entrusting themselves to God, recognizing God will judge all things by his righteousness of cognizance. It is a clear sign of an inescapable reckoning for every single careless word and every single dark deed that was spoken or planned against what is righteous and what is true and what concerns God's glory and his people. What grounds it? the righteousness of cognizance. And so this is a terrifying thing for the wicked because there is no place of escape. When judgment comes on the final day, one of the one of many images that comes out of Isaiah 35 and following, Revelation 6 and following, is that the wicked will pursue the mountains to fall on them and veil them from the judgment of God's righteousness in the face of Christ. They will search out islands from which they can hide, but what will happen? The mountains will flee, the islands will skip away and disappear, and there will be an opening of judgment, and the wicked will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and there will be no hope of escape ever from his righteous judgment. And that is why we continue to implore the wicked.
whether they're in a religious institutional context, a secular institutional context, plotting evil and carrying it out against the people of God, we call out to them to be reconciled to God and turn from that wickedness and to the one who has borne the righteous wrath of God against sin in Jesus Christ. And and it really, Camden, this one, I mean, the rest, just incredibly wonderful. But this righteousness of cognizance, I think, ought to have a special place of encouragement for the righteous, but also a special place of, if I can put it this way, um, of of inducing proper terror uh, from the wicked as they start to grasp and understand the gravity of their sin and what a terrible thing it is to fall into the hands of a righteous judge. Now, Voss uh, clearly uses some biblical examples. He references Amos as a key example here for this righteousness of cognizance, Amos 7, 7 through 9. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. We see also in Isaiah 28, 16 through 17, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation, and whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line, and righteousness the plumb line, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters will overwhelm the shelter. So clearly some biblical examples of God's awareness, and then that leads into the second uh, facet of God's righteousness, that being a righteousness of retribution. Speak to us a bit. How does Voss describe God as the one and uh, who gives retribution, who indeed punishes sin? Well, we may be able to compress this one a little bit more than we did the first one, uh, but uh, he takes aim at Albrecht Ritchel, prominent liberal theologian of the 20th century, who argued this point that the punishment of sin is a secondary, even ancillary thing utterly and entirely subordinated to securing the salvation for the righteous. So um, the, the positive end of salvation means just this, that if God is going to save the righteous, he's got to do something with the wicked. And what is that something with the wicked? Removing them from the scene in order that he might magnify his benevolence, magnify his love, and if you're thinking in richly in and classical liberal categories, so that the kingdom of ethics and love might thrive and flourish in the world, something along those lines. Um, but Voss comments that while Ritchell's position has a kernel of truth in it, of course God's uh, dealing with the wicked always brings into view his love and covenant faithfulness toward his people. He says that... Um, the, the, that benevolence and that deliverance of the righteous cannot be the fundamental reason why God punishes sin. So Voss says that the mistake of ritual lies in taking the part for the whole. The part, which is the concern to deliver the righteous, is taken to be the whole of God's retribution against sin. You just, as a secondary, almost reflex reaction, you get rid of the wicked so that the righteous can be saved. But Voss is saying something uh, really basic here, that there is ultimately, and this is so critical, there is a God-centered and not salvation-centered explanation for the punishment of sin. And I think what he means by that, Camden, is that the pre predominant concern for God judging sin is not a human one. It's not the deliverance of his people. That might sound good. It might make us feel good. It might make us think we're really important to God, uh, which is the uh, propensity of liberal theology. But that's not why God does it. The reason God does it is to manifest his own glory, his inherent righteousness, 
as the creator and judge of all flesh. And so Amos and Isaiah, according to, to Voss, emphasize this theocentric understanding. And, um, and Camden, a a Amos 5.24 might be worth um, uh, us reading because Voss quotes it and then I think makes one of his more insightful comments in this section about what that teaching entails. Just uh, says, Amos 5.24 says, let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Yeah, that, that, see, if you take a kind of Richlian or liberal view of this text, it's so easy to view that as some kind of future utopia where justice rolls down like waters, righteousness is a mighty stream in a beautiful utopian paradise of social justice. It could be taken that way. I'm not saying it is taken that way by all, but it could be. But Voss says that this text in context, especially in Amos, is not a demand for social justice, not a demand for the uprightness of Israel even. He says the idea is rather, quote, the time for reasoning and expostulation has gone by. Nothing remains but divine judgment rushing down and sweeping away sinners, page 252. Thus, this text is not to be used for the pursuit of a social utopia on earth. It is not a, uh, a prophecy of a time of um, freedom from all earthly oppression for the people of God on earth prior to the second coming of Christ. It is rather an expression of judgment that comes from God and abolishes wickedness. And, and Voss says, Amos is the preacher of justice and retribution par excellence, so that uh, salvation is, is almost lost in Amos's viewpoint. Why? Because he sees so clearly the, that, that, that the righteousness of God and the judgment of sin is theocentric and retributive, not social, political, or even at, at this point, concerned for the salvation of God's people. It's concerned for the unveiling of the glory of God and the upholding of his righteousness, his character against sin. That is something, Camden, that I think has been lost entirely in the liberal tradition Voss is interacting with. Mm -hmm. And I suspect it is um, on something of a respirator in terms of many evangelical quarters in our 21st century context. It is... Uh, often not understood in that profound theocentric and retributive sense, this righteousness um, and justice rolling down as waters and flowing forth as a mighty stream. But that's what Voss says is in view. And in the book of Amos, I believe we could say with confidence, it's incontestable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably worth mentioning at least that sin is, is an offense against God. Uh, maybe that is presumed by everyone listening, but it's not presumed by everyone who's dealing with God's righteousness, or at least considering it philosophically or even biblically. Sin is an offense against God, and so to speak of his uh, retribution is, is certainly uh, on point. It changes the way we understand that. We changes the way, we, if God knows all things, he's cognizant of all things, and sin is an offense against him— he's the righteous standard himself as he is, then he will pour out his wrath upon all sin one way or another. And in doing so, then we come to our third facet. We see the righteousness of vindication, this third aspect of God's judicial or forensic righteousness. Uh, what is, what is, how does Voss summarize here this righteousness of vindication? This one is... Is maybe I spoke too soon about the first one, cognizance being so useful. This one was probably the most surprisingly insightful to me personally. Uh, although you and I have read through this numbers of times and we knew it was coming, uh, it's it's nonetheless quite insightful. The summary is this: that according to Voss, Jehovah decides between two causes, and He puts one in the right the other in the wrong, and he does it to fulfill his purpose in the world. So there's that theocentric retributive concern for the glory of God predominating in this presentation, radically God-centered. Um, and Voss says that this idea of vindication 
really needs to be understood with the nuances that arise from attending to the history of special revelation. He talks about the, the Psalms especially. And um, Camden, um, we can flag one Psalm. I think it's Psalm 18, 19 through 20. Uh, where, where to preview it, Voss says that in the Psalms, God's people are, quote, righteous and appeal to Jehovah to acknowledge this and to treat them accordingly. Let's do, one of those texts is Psalm 18, 19 through 20. Could think we could read that? Sure. Uh, Psalm 18, 19 through 20 says, The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. He has repaid me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I've kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now, this is this text will give you fits if you misunderstand it. Voss says you must understand the setting. And let me tell you what the setting is not. Uh, this text is not speaking absolutely and bringing into view personal final justification before God at the end of the age. It is not about the doctrine of justification. In its proper setting, Voss says, the psalmist is speaking relatively, and the vindication is in relation to wicked men. It's not absolute vindication before the tribunal of God's um, law that requires uh, personal, perfect, exact, and entire obedience. Uh, David, for instance, uh, rather, it is justification or vindication in contrast to wicked men who do not know or love the Lord. David, for instance could claim to be righteous, think about this, when wicked Saul was persecuting him, seeking political power, pursuing the expansion of his reputation, and promoting an empty shell of pseudo-piety publicly, all while persecuting David, whom he knew was righteous. He confessed it. He told David, you are more righteous than I, but what did he do? For the sake of his own reputation and for the expansion of his own kingdom and his own platform and sphere of influence, he persecuted him. So when David is writing the Psalms, that brings into view um, him, not in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ by which we are justified, but it brings into view someone who knows the Lord, will not bow to the secret plans of a king and uh, engage in subterfuge for his political conquest, the extension of his kingdom and the promotion of his name and glory. Saul surrounded himself with yes men. He surrounded himself with people who would do that. If Saul said, we should throw a spear at David today, they said, how many do you want? Uh, But David, and this is what provoked Saul so much. This is where David almost has a kind of prophetic mantle upon him as a king. David would never let go of the truth. The kingdom of God is theocentric, involves the suffering of the Lord's anointed, and he will be persecuted for righteousness sake. David embraced that. David knew that was his identity as a type of David's greater son, David's Lord. It's a type of the Lord's anointed. And so David and the remnant formed around him upheld in Voss's words to um, uh, 53, the true religion and would not let it go. What is true religion? To worship the Lord God for his glory according to his revealed will in a way that bears the reproach of his Messiah. And so when the psalmists speak of vindication in this way, uh, and it's the proper way to speak. It's not a discussion about meriting God's favor and justification at all. It's rather this relative contrast between the righteous who trust in the Messiah, walk in the promises of God, and live for his glory, versus the wicked who claim to do those things. But what do they do in essence? What do they do in practice, rather? Who are who are they essentially and in practice? They are the despisers of God's glory the rejectors of the suffering of his cross and the persecutors of his people. And against those people, the righteous in the Messiah can cry out, even though their righteous is not perfect, and ask God to judge them according to their uprightness in contrast to the abject wickedness of those who despise God and his kingdom. And so Voss, when he's talking about that, 
aspect of righteousness and that of vindication along these lines, it's a, it's unusually insightful, I think. Very, very useful, very encouraging for those who know the Lord. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a corporate dimension to this too, even as David may speak as king, as head of state, but he's a type of Christ and being that uh, the king and the man after God's own heart. Uh, we see sometimes this vindication being of the nation of God, being of the church against, against the nations has a cosmic significance to it certainly a typological one that needs to be accounted for. And we see that uh, in Micah 7, 7 through 9, right? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, and, and what's so wonderful about that in this parallel between the individual and the corporate is is this. I mean, First John, uh, I hope my memory's serving me here, First John 1.10, um, there is no one without sin. No one is sinless except for Jesus after the fall, period, at any point. Even on our best day, in our best moment, we are constantly falling short of the glory of God. So no one is sin-free. Yet, those uh, in a kind of Westminster Confession 16, 5 and 6 sense, those who are joined to Christ for his sake, not only are their persons accepted as righteous and justification, but their works are accepted as righteous. So um, sincere, weak, accompanied by great weakness and sin— Um, They are nonetheless pleasing in God's sight for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I think something along those lines qualifies that Micah 7, 7 through 9 context. As for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be light to me. I will bear the indignation, indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him, all sin until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. You see, it's not because of perfect sinlessness that there is vindication for the righteous remnant of Israel. It is that even though sinful, as are all, there is a fundamental walking in the light a characteristic loving and serving God, albeit imperfectly and in weakness. And in light of that, then this text, by the way, Micah 7, 7 through 9, parallels 1 Corinthians 4, 5 really well. He will bring me out to the light and I shall look upon his vindication um, in union with the Messiah. And so this is a, a beautiful text, a great comfort for a suffering church and And it really starts, what we start to see, Camden, is though Voss defines this up front as an attribute of God, something identical to his essence, and then asks us to think of him as judge, doesn't it turn out to be of wonderful encouragement and great pastoral service to us as we suffer? Uh, I think uh, we're seeing something of the, the great practical value of what this multifaceted righteousness of God means for his covenant people. Sure, and this is at the heart of you know, true religion and, and covenant theology, that God's righteousness is on display. It is an expression of him, of him as he is in his very being. And we, being made in his image, are called to live righteously. We even were created. Adam was created in true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. But then we start to see uh, the working out after the fall into sin and misery how we don't measure up at all, and there's no way to escape the Lord because he knows all things, and uh, he's perfectly righteous and will judge. Um, That might leave us in despair. But the beautiful thing is that through the Lord's covenant, through his own provision, through Jesus Christ, we have salvation. That's the fourth aspect. But also the salvation understood in so many ways that the Reformation brought to the fore. Uh, building and, and rediscovering in many ways what the Bible teaches itself about this righteousness that we receive. You think of, uh, I love the examples that we have, you know, in Titus 3, but also in Ephesians 4, being clothed and putting on the new man. Uh, this righteousness that we could never express on our own because it's a perfect righteousness from the Lord, an expression of his very being, we come to bear through imputation, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Uh, But also, uh, it gets worked out within us as God sanctifies us, not just crediting us with righteousness, uh, 
but causing us also to walk in a newness of life, to walk by the Spirit, Romans 8, 1 through 4, for example. So it's an entire comprehensive understanding of our life. And this righteous God of the Old Testament certainly is a God and the God to be feared. He is the righteous judge overall. He's not a different God now than he was then. However, we come to see in the progressive unfolding of of, uh, God's plan of salvation throughout time, throughout covenant history, now how this righteousness can be ours and indeed is ours uh, by grace through faith. Yes, and and, and Voss makes that wonderful observation uh, in this uh, section on the righteousness that uh, a vindication that that brings about salvation, uh, that not only is this righteousness an attribute, uh, an intention of God for his people, but it is even embodied outside of him in his people, which you just expressed, Camden. And and so in that regard, Voss notes that this righteousness, um, at like Isaiah 45, uh, 24, only in the Lord, it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength to him. Uh, shall come and be ashamed, all who are incensed against him. You see that language there of being engrafted into the Lord, being in union and communion with the Lord by fellowship with the promised or now crucified and ascended Messiah, brings about a state of affairs in which in the Lord it is said of us that we are righteous and there is a provision. G- G- for instance, 1 Corinthians one ten. Um, Paul says, Jesus has become um, wisdom from God. That is what? Our righteousness, holiness, and our redemption. And and so in that way, Voss says, righteousness is synonymous with salvation, Isaiah 51, 5, light, Isaiah 59, 9, glory, Isaiah 62, 1 through 3. And, and so it, it really is, Camden, not merely something that characterizes God, but particularly in creation and then in redemptive recreation in Christ, it's something that is both gifted forensically, as you said, and something worked in us. Uh, and that work is not for our justification, the gifting and the imputing is, but there's a comprehensive conformity to the image of Christ, which oh, yeah. you've been working on for years. Well, you know, if you think about both sides of that, uh, they're, they're necessary for the gospel. Sometimes we can have a forensic-centric view of the gospel. Uh, the forensic justification is absolutely critical. Without it, we don't have any good news. But if I am only credited with being righteous, what hope do I have for my present battle with indwelling sin, for example? You know, we can think about how this works out in the counseling scenario. If somebody's struggling with pornography and lust and it's welling up within their hearts. You can tell them you've been justified. And that's true. That's good news that, that Christ's righteousness covers over your sins. Your sins are forgiven. You received. You're no longer an alien, but you have also been adopted You know, through this forensic act. Uh, we, we also become children of God and are accepted and received into his house as, as heirs, no longer strangers. You're forgiven. But I want something more than that, and indeed, Christ gives us something more than that. Not only are we forgiven, but through the working of the Holy Spirit, he's conforming us into his own image, into the resurrection image, the the, the power, the glorified, consummate life. So you can have hope that it's not your own works that are earning you righteousness or your status before God. But praise be to God that his Holy Spirit is in us to change us and put sin to death. <laughs> so that Amen. when we do enter into the new heavens and the new earth and in full, consummate, glorified existence, we will not be struggling with indwelling sin. You will not still be battling with, um, you know, the, the flesh. That's what the gospel is all about. It's about knowing Christ and being made like him, having full union and communion with God now and consummately in the future. So Voss is important in this section, these six pages, to explain God's righteousness and to explain the salvation, but also to, to remind us that we can we can err by forgetting any of these aspects, as Ritual did on the judgment of God, the positive 
positivists did, but also if we go too, you know, too heavy into the forensic notions of, of righteousness being imputed to us without also um, accounting for uh, the righteousness that God works in and through us uh, and, and by his spirit. So it's always, it's always the whole thing for him. And that's really why, you know, covenant theology and this deeper Protestant conception though, is always uh, at the forefront of his, of his theology. Yes, and and then capping it off, he he talks about it very briefly, and will be brief as well, the um, righteousness as a an expression of God's benevolence, uh, His goodness um, in revealing Himself to creatures as the judge, the judge who condemns wickedness, the judge who saves His righteousness, who saves His righteous in union with Christ after the fall. Uh, to whose image they're being conformed. And, um, you know, Camden, as I've thought about the the work that you've done on image of God, one of the things that uh, I don't know if you have, have put it this way, I think you put, you've put it better than this, but um, the, the hope of being endowed with the image of Christ and the revelation of God's goodness to us in that image endowment is that at the last day, our condition catches up with our status, right? We are oh, yeah. right. Uh, freed once and for all from sin, uh, not just uh, clothed in righteousness, but filled with it in a way by which our communion bond with God comes to its full fruition. And so this, the, these uh, facets here are, are integrally related and have bearing on so many topics. In fact, Camden, we've kept it to where Voss kept it, but this is such a rich and profound section we could probably, we won't do it, but we could probably go on and draw implications for virtually every other locus in systematic theology and <laughs> right. talk about this under every um, epoch in the unfolding of the history of special revelation. Incredibly rich. Uh, and, I and agree. Beautiful. Yeah. And who would expect such uh, richness in just talking about uh, some aspects of God's revelation in the period of the prophets? But this is what we've come to expect as we've worked through biblical theology here, Old and New Testaments by Gerhardus Voss, it's why we march through this book page by page and give it, you know, the attention of a decade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it rewards such careful study. And of course, we're, we, uh, we like to build on what Voss is saying. We're not just reading the book and then um, just interpreting it for a contemporary ear, but uh, certainly be hopefully becoming inspired with a lower case I uh, to, to go and do uh, further theological work as a result. So it's always a pleasure to talk about these things. Next time, uh, when we get back into the pages of BT, we'll be addressing God's so-called emotions. So that should be exciting. Uh, it certainly uh, it was brought again to my attention with a very popular uh, evangelical book, which uh, no doubt will pop up on Reformed Media Review uh, in the near future. So it's it's always at the fore, God's impassibility, human emotion, and, and the description of God in the Old Testament as one who has emotions. Well, how, is the, how is the Old Testament speaking? What does that mean for God's not only impassibility, but also his immutability, which the Bible also clearly teaches? So we'll get into that next time. Uh, and we're also uh, in in tandem working through Voss's sermons in Grace and Glory as we have availability and as our, our dear brother Danny Olinger is able to contribute. Please pray for him. He's been ill. Um, those of you in the OPC certainly know, know the issues uh, that he's struggling with, but um, as a matter of being discreet, uh, he's has a very serious issue. So we want to continue to pray for him and he's recovering and the Lord has been good. The Lord is always faithful, no matter what happens. Uh, but uh, I received some encouraging note from him even this morning. Uh, so we continue to pray for him and lift him up. Uh, he's such a dear brother in the Lord, and we pray that uh, that he would recover soon. Uh, so next time, uh, we'll pick back up uh, right back on page 255. Check out the website for previous episodes in the archive. You can also head on over to Reformed Academy, a section of our website where you can subscribe uh, for free, I should say enroll. You can register for free for a whole host of uh, theological courses that you can take on demand at your own time in your own in your own way. And so they're also means of uh, self-assessment and uh, news to come very soon uh, regarding our, our latest round of cohorts on uh, Van Til's Trinitarian theology. 
All this is online at reformedforum.org. I want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.